Welcome. Welcome. House Wives of True Crime. You sound so like sexy this morning. Do I? <laughs> you do. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Welcome. Uh, remember What's when you had, you had that sexy voice for like three months? Oh my God. That was so fun. <laughs> <laughs> I had COVID before COVID was cool. Yeah. And yeah. It gave me a real sexy voice. Um, okay. So what's up? Well, the weather is crazy again here in Texas. So that's why we're recording early. Cool. It's kind of fun, you know? Um, so this, you guys, I don't know if you're on our Patreon, but if you are not, you should get on it. This last week we did a Q and a, and we have a couple extra questions uh, that I didn't get to on the Patreon. So I was going to ask you them here, Gretchy. Okay. We'll do that for the first seven minutos. Okay. okay. Bring them right. on. Okay. So this is kind of a fun one, you guys, because I like dressing up. And so somebody asked us where we go to shop online. I think we go to the same place. Well, I shop at Nordstrom's Rack online a lot because I live close to Nordstrom's Rack. So I just like buy everything and then I, you know, you take it, it all back because I, oh, you take it I, back there. I take it back there. Mm -hmm. I hate trying on clothes in stores, loathe, hate it, hate it. So I do that. And um, I mean, I'm a sucker for the Amazon shit. And it always oh. sucks. It doesn't always suck. You I know? actually got something good there the other day. Once in a while. Yeah, you got to read the reviews. And once in a while, like maybe when I get to my goal weight, I buy something from this website called Revolve. Oh, okay. They, they yes. have pretty good stuff. Yeah. They have. So I used to shop Revolve all the time. But I have now, I am a Vici whore. It's V I C I. Vici is good too, but you can't take anything back. And I need a good return policy. You can. Well, I think it's just an e exchange or they give that's you store different. credit, but it's. But that's not how I like to shop. I like okay. to buy it in multiple sizes and see which one works. Yeah. Okay. Well, I shop there a lot because it's a reasonably priced clothes. And so I feel like it's okay if I only wear it one time or a couple times. And. I'm not overwhelmed with, you know, having to wear it all the time. And I'd like to switch up my clothes. My closet is real packed. Yeah. The truth is, you guys, I don't go anywhere. So I don't do, I don't want to make it sound like I do a lot of shopping. Every time I go somewhere, you hear about it. It's usually to see tap. So <laughs> it's like maybe three times a year, I buy myself a new outfit. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm wearing the yoga pants. I shop more than you for sure. Okay, mm -hmm. here is one from Casey Jade. Uh, she asked if we are enjoying this podcast thing and how long we think we'll do it. Oh, that is a good question, Casey. Um, if Tab gets her shit together, we'll do it forever. <laughs> <laughs> and that, uh, and that's the truth. Yeah, okay. We are enjoying it. Casey most, yeah, we are most of it, the Casey. time most of the time 99 percent of the time maybe a little less but sometimes but it, the actual podcasting is not the part we don't enjoy it's the like paperwork and other shit that yeah it's the know, business grown-up stuff yeah yeah the business part we don't enjoy and sometimes because we never take a break it does feel like stressful at times when we have to get our case done and and you know there are points where we're like oh we have a yeah it's shit like a ton job. of other stuff to do but we have to yeah. we have to buckle down uh this one is from Paige she says what does T love and hate about G and vice versa oh okay you go you first <laughs> I go first okay <laughs> What I love about Gretchen, I didn't even, I haven't even thought about this. So let's see. Okay. There is a lot of stuff that I love about Gretchen, but I love that she's very flexible with her time, which makes the podcasting very easy. 
I love that I can call her at any second, even when she's on vacation and um, spill whatever is on my mind or just vent to her. And she doesn't offer me lots of critiques. What I hate about Gretchen most um, <laughs> is that she always is on my case about getting my shit together. Um, <laughs> Uh -huh. And I don't like that, but I understand it. And I know that I need to do it. And I guess that's it, really. There's not a lot that I don't like about you. Oh, great. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. What I love about Tab is sh that she is easy peasy. The reason, reason why we get along so well, I think we're both pretty easy peasy. We are not like, let's go out, drink too much and cry in the corner. We're like, <laughs> we're going to have a fucking good time. <laughs> like, this I don't know true. about you, but we're going to have a good time. And we have a good time no matter if we're at the airport, just hanging out or any time of day, it's always going to be fun. So, um, and our friendship is just real easy like that. So I like how easy she is. She doesn't start the drama, though she steps in it once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, and what I hate the most is, yeah, she's a procrastinator. She doesn't get her, you know, shit together. And I'm kind of the opposite. I'm pretty OCD about stuff. And so, yeah. I am a 99 percent. <laughs> Oh yeah. So I, I, I don't like being the bad guy ever, but sometimes I got to kind of write her ass. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This so is true. that's, that, that's real talk. Uh huh. Okay, okay. I think we're coming close. Okay. You got any more? Two more really quick. One, okay. have we ever been in a fight? This comes from sister on the fly. Yes. Two in 20 years. Two. I only remember one. <laughs> <laughs> then these I like, always forget. <laughs> the, what, right before your wedding and when I was pregnant. Okay. Now I do remember those. Okay. Um, but we got over it. We did. One took longer than the other. One took um, longer than the other. But we did get over it. And yeah. then the other one, and this came from a couple people. What are the chances that Gretchen will join me in Texas? Mm, good question. Good question. I don't know. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> don't when know. she comes here, the, she the, always wants to move here. And then you yeah, get back into your mundane truth. routine. And, 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 I, then... and, and I go to the beach. The truth is, we'll see how my kids like school this year. If my kids are real difficult. So if like, I mean, they're not difficult children, but they all have challenges. And so if they are dig in their school, which so far they are, it's going to be real hard for me to leave. Yeah, I would agree. I think, I mean, if you listen to Patreon, that's the reason we moved. So you, you do what your yeah. kids, what makes yeah. your kids happy. At I least think. at this point, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it's ruled out for the future, but at this point, while they're in elementary, that's right. just the deal. All right. So if you want to hear a lot more about us and, you know, like we've said before, Patreon is where you get the juicier stuff. So head over to patreon.com forward slash yeah. housewives of true crime. Also, by the way, I got Southwest points for days. So I'm going to just keep bugging her ass in Texas every chance I get. So, <laughs> Good. you know. All right, let's get to your crime. Okay, crime time. Okay, today's case is listener suggestion from Maggie May. Isn't that a cute name? I love that name. Yeah. Thanks, Maggie. Mm -hmm. I takes... love the name Maggie. Yeah. I love the name May. Right? Mm -hmm. Both. Together. Cute. Boom. Boom. Okay. It takes place in Prescott, Arizona. Prescott seems like a nice place to live. Population about 120,000. You can buy a real nice three bedroom casa for under 400. Prescott is north of Phoenix. It's a very pretty area with 
you know, the lakes and the trees and such. It's real green. It lends itself to people that are the outdoorsy types. And Stephen DeMocker and Carol Kennedy were those types. Despite having different last names, they had been married for 25 years. I think Carol didn't take his name, like kind of tells you a little bit about her. She was a teacher at the university there and she was an artist as well as like into that like new age vibe, you know, she's that woman. They had been living in Prescott for the last few years, but they had bounced around before that. In fact, for about two years, they lived in my old hood in Ojai, California. While Stephen worked as an outdoor educator for Patagonia, which headquarters are in Ventura, Ventura. where Mm -hmm. we grew up. So basically, he taught the employees how all the outdoor stuff that Patagonia makes was put to use. So I planned all these trips and stuff. I mean, seems like a pretty awesome job. It sounds like the best job ever. (laughs) When we grew up in Ventura, everyone wants to work for Patagonia, right? Yeah. And a lot of people. Yeah, a great company to work for. Like that is the job that that's everyone's dream job. So it's true. Well, yeah. I mean, it was relatively short lived for Stephen, though, because he had an affair with another employee. And that At thing, Patagonia? That sort of, yes. And apparently, that sort of thing don't fly at the Patagucci, like we call it. Yeah. Um, no. They're like a family company. Sure. Well, it's a, a little family. I mean, apparently, so it don't, they don't like that. He was, Stephen was married and this other employee was married too. They don't like a lot of things. So it's not, I'm not, I'm not at like, they don't like a, a lot of things. I'm not a huge Patagonia fan anymore. I used to be, but not over know. the last few years. But anyways, so yes, they anyways, don't like affairs. I don't, they don't like, like affairs, affairs either. Fairs usually right? end up pretty bad. Yeah. I just don't think about people getting fired for that kind of thing, though, anymore. It's like whatever you do outside of work is like whatever. But but it was at work. Yeah, I guess. Sometimes people have like you can't fraternize, you know, you can't like actually date and like employees can't date each other in the workplace. It's like, yeah, that seems a little silly to me. I do think it's silly because guess what? Both of us met our husbands. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Okay, well, this wasn't Stephen's first or last affair. It seemed like wherever they moved, he managed to get it in somewhere. Okay. <laughs> okay. Stephen, still... Stephen was one of those. <laughs> Stephen was one of those. That's just the one incident I chose to pick because it related to me. Okay. Right. So, but still on the outside, Stephen and Carol appear to be, you know, this like cool, active couple. They were raising these two daughters that are just lovely, smart girls. But we know, you know, no one really knows what is going on behind closed door and what was going through Carol's head all those years that Stephen's extracurricular activities weren't just mountain biking and kayaking, like most people that knew him thought. He had a thing for side chicks and Carol knew it. And after 25 years of putting up with it and being married to him, she divorced his ass. At this point, their daughters were pretty much grown. And when they had initially moved to Prescott, Stephen worked as a professor at the university and he like taught some outdoor bullshit. But he changed careers to be a financial advisor because it had a much more lucrative potential. Okay. And it was lucrative for him in the beginning when he started making the money. He really knew how to spend it. He did a lot of, you know, weekend getaways to five-star resorts, nice cars, and all the, you know, top of the line gear for his outdoor hobbies. You know, that's mm-hmm. stuff. Mm-hmm. Have you been to REI? It it's, costs a pretty penny. Oh my gosh. By the way, yeah. I went there uh, for the first time in a long time. And I can't believe how expensive everything is. 
shoot. If you want to yeah. go rock climbing, you better, you better be like a millionaire. Yeah. Like very yeah. expensive. Yeah. It's expensive. So, okay. Well, it was all the spending of the money was fun while it lasted, but sometime around 2007, the fun stopped. Remember when we had that financial crisis yeah. in America and yeah. all the banks got in big trouble? Do you well, remember? So, so did Steven. Okay. He went from making $30,000 a month to 13 k a month which by the way hello downsize i mean 13k a month is plenty of money to live well off of right <laughs> like, <laughs> okay he's seriously still, he's still rocking it was yeah. he in california at this time no still? no he was no 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 no. they they were in prescott arizona they actually the Dude, ohio stint doing... was like in the late 80s okay so he's actually doing real well he's doing real well yeah okay so Steven was still spending it, the money, like it was growing on trees, though. He had taken out money from his retirement account. He also took out lines of credit on the homes he owned, which he owned his house, and then he owned Carol's house. And he racked up some serious credit card debt. Steven is pretty ruthless. He borrowed $20,000 a month for three months in a row from his parents, which forced them to go back to work, take out a second mortgage on their home. But Stephen didn't care. He was still spending weekends at the fancy resorts, playing golf, drinking the overpriced cocktails. Can you believe that? Well, it's really hard to change your lifestyle. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> What a, I think he's an asshole. Okay. Steven is kidding. something. Of, Side of note. Of course. That's asinine. Okay. He is very thin. Thin? He has a long face and he's very thin. Okay. I generally don't trust men that thin. <laughs> but <laughs> like a thing. Maybe he just has a, an overactive just a bitchy, metabolism. judgy thing. For me, yeah, I mean, I definitely don't think it's hot, okay? Like, I don't hate a dad bod, at like, at all. Dude, your okay? husband is thin and eats, like, he, anything no, he wants. No, no, yeah, he does. My husband is, like, a bean, po he's not thin. Like, the, he, this guy is, like, thin. Okay, I want to, I want to, I think what you're saying is he doesn't have any kind of muscle in his arms, so it looks like. yeah feminine I don't know not necessarily he just has a long face and he's like rail thin he's about the same height as my husband but he weighs 30 pounds less okay 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 so imagine that my husband is just perfect oh like, my perfect god way. that is so sweet of you to say <laughs> right <laughs> uh, Gretchen's well, tree's coming down by the way oh yeah if you hear anything it, or if I die in the middle of this podcast, it's because it crashed on me. Hopefully so. that does not happen. Hopefully, right? Okay, well, apparently lots of ladies are feeling the thin type. Oh. Steven, yeah. And Steven was feeling himself. He was on like 17 dating apps, I read, which I didn't even know there were 17 dating apps. Well, you met your husband and when there was like one, so... I never I got on a dating a app ever. Yeah. No. Also, Steven took a bunch of hormones that made him like extra, extra. He liked, like you know, extra, feeling extra like horny? virile. Yeah. Well, you, you would be surprised. Like, why didn't he get beefier with his like testosterone hormones? Because he's doing all this. He does all this running and shit. Oh. And he eats all healthy all oh. the time. You know? Yeah. I know. Okay. The type. Okay. So Steven, I mean, what I'm telling you is Steven is a douche. Okay. We know that, but people close to him agree that his redeeming quality was that he was a good father and he probably was. He and Carol, Carol must've thought so as well because they had managed to co-parent kind of nicely together. They tried to remain friends. They did stuff like go together to take their daughter to the airport when she left to study abroad 
But things had gotten tense between Stephen and Carol. Stephen was bitter. He had to pay her $6,000 a month in alimony. He thought this was bullshit because that order was based on when he was making the money, but he wasn't, you know, making as much anymore. So he sent Carol some emails saying like, hey, since I'm in like a shit ton of debt, can you just like, you know, do you take care of yourself? And Carol replied, you know, like kick rock, Steven, stop spending your money on, you know, whores and golf trips. You owe me, you know? Yeah. Pay up. Yeah. Yeah. She had confided in one of her friends that the divorce had left her real strapped for cash and that she didn't always know how she was going to make ends meet until Stephen paid her. And he was late at doing it often. Carol lived on a piece of property that was a little more remote and it had a guest cottage. So she rented it out to a man named Ed Knapp to bring in some extra money. Ed was an interesting character. He was a divorced father. People describe him as like a surfer bum. Him and Carol enjoyed each other's company and would frequently sit outside and, you know, drink wine together. They were supportive of each other in relation to Carol venting about Stephen giving her the runaround financially. And Ed had been diagnosed with melanoma and Carol was very like the very nurturing, caring type. So she was a good person for Ed to lean on. According to Ed and some of Carol's friends, Carol had suspected that Stephen had been coming into her home while she was gone and snooping through her personal beeswax. And obviously that annoyed her, right? But it it doesn't sound like she feared Stephen over this because she wasn't a door locker. And you would think that would make you become one, right? Okay, so she always left her house kind of open. But, you know, she says it was it was nice having Ed there because she was kind of remote, you know. So it was nice having like a man close by. The thing about Carol and Ed was that Ed was feeling Carol. but. Carol was not feeling him back. She actually had a boyfriend that she had been seeing for a few months. He lived in another state, but she was at this point happier than ever about her new relationship. They had plans to sail around the world together, and she thought she had found the man she would spend the rest of her life with. But Ed didn't seem to get it. He told people that he had such a deep connection with Carol that people just couldn't understand it. I mean, he really thought they were like next level. He also was trying to open up some kind of coffee franchise and he thought that he could get Carol to invest in it with him. And it would be so lucrative that it would solve both their, you know, kind of financial pickles. But Carol eventually ended up telling Ed, you know, no thanks, that Mm -hmm. she wasn't able to pursue it. So that just kind of left Ed like not getting any love in or business from Carol. Well, on July 2nd, 2008 at 738 p.m., Carol was on the phone with her mother like she was every night. Her mother lived across the country by herself and they checked in on each other every night. Well, all of the sudden, Carol said, oh no. And then the call dropped. Her mother, Ruth, was very concerned when she couldn't reach her daughter after that. And so she called the local police and asked them to go check on Carol. She also tried to get a hold of Ed and her granddaughters and Steve to check on Carol. She wasn't able to reach Ed, who was at his ex-wife's house watching his son. Charlotte, her granddaughter, who was living along with her boyfriend with Steve for the summer at his house, didn't take her grandmother's phone call right away. And Stephen was out mountain bike riding and his phone had died. Charlotte eventually listened to her grandmother's voicemail and tried to reach her mother and couldn't. She decided to wait for her father to get home to see what to do. 
Okay. Side note, Charlotte says they all ate dinner together, her, her boyfriend and her dad regularly. And because it was getting late, it was after 9 PM by now, her and her boyfriend went to the grocery store to pick up some ingredients to make a vegetable stir fry. I just have to say, this is why I am weight challenged. Never in my life, if I have been hungry after 9 p.m., has a vegetable stir fry been an option? (laughs) After 9 p.m., my options are usually like pizza, french fries, chicken nuggets. I'm certainly not going to the store to buy vegetables to chop up to stir fry. (laughs) Okay. 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 But anyways, they came home from the store, made dinner. Steven arrived back home around 10. He had some scratches on him. He said it was a real doozy of a night um, on his ride. And sorry, his phone died. Charlotte expressed her concern about her mama, and he said, it's not appropriate for me to go check on your mother, so you go with your boyfriend. By the time Charlotte and her boyfriend arrived at Carol's home, they weren't able to check on her because the police had conducted the welfare check that Grandma Ruth had asked them to perform, Mm -hmm. and they just looked in the window and saw Carol's body on the floor. Police told Charlotte and her boyfriend at the scene that her mother was dead. She broke down as expected. It wasn't clear right away whether or not this was a homicide because there was no sign of forced entry. And there was a fallen ladder and a bookshelf on top of and beside Carol. They were able though to determine because of the blood spatter that those things were placed there after Carol had been killed Mm. Mm -hmm. and she had been beaten to death. They wanted to make it look like she fell off the ladder. Yes. It was staged. Yeah. They were able to determine though that Carol had died of a skull injury she had been beaten to death okay well guess who their first suspect was the neighbor well should have been the neighbor but i yeah well oh no that's ed yeah that's ed steve did i say ed oh my god did i call him ed i thought ed is i think i oh my god his name is jim i'm sorry why i think i've been calling him ed i don't know I'm just going <laughs> to, I think I thought he was Ed and then I realized it was Jim. I'm sorry. We're just going to, I'm just going to keep calling him Ed. Okay. I don't want to be confusing. I would think that the, well, I guess the ex-husband, it would be the first person that they would think, but I think it's Ed slash Jim. Well, it took a few months, but eventually Steve was the one who was charged with Carol's murder. Remember, Ed was watching his kid at his ex-wife's house. Okay. Okay. So I am going to just kind of cut to the chase and tell you the evidence they had to point the finger at Steve. Okay. One, his, his alibi sucks. It wasn't like he regularly went for mountain bike rides in the evening. Everyone agrees that this was unusual. Okay. Usually he would go like scratches. Yeah. Yeah. He would go running and and like stuff like that. But, you know, he wasn't really an evening mountain biker. Steve had a girlfriend at the time. No surprise. And she gave an interview and said, yeah, he was definitely acting strange at the time all this happened. And he also was not known to let his phone die like ever. He was known to keep a spare battery on him. He's like that extra. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also, there were mountain bike tracks found in the vicinity of Carol's place that matched Stevens. But I mean, the thing about that is, is that they also matched 80% of all mountain bike 
tires because it's the most popular one. So, you know, yeah. What are you going to do about that? Yeah. Okay. They also found shoe tracks and found them to be from a really unique pair of high end running shoes. There were only 8,600 pairs of these shoes made. They did not find them in Stephen's possession, but they did find that Stephen had purchased a pair two years prior. Steve says, so, so what? He never keeps a pair of running shoes more than six months. So, I mean, that's sort of believable because he's so bougie, but also, I mean, it's like a real quinky dink, right? right? Steve's DNA was not found anywhere at the scene, but there was an unknown male's DNA found under Carol's fingernail house when he became a suspect and took pictures. And when the golf club theory came about, they remembered a golf sock sitting by itself in Steve's carport. When they went back, it was gone and the whole shelf had been cleaned. Hmm. Steve told investigators that he didn't know what happened to the golf sock, but wouldn't you know, it turned up. And so instead of handing it over to the police at this point, he gave it to his lawyer who also forgot to give it to the police, which turned into like a whole, you know, thing for Steve later on. Okay. Steve's explanation for the reappearing golf sock was that a monsoon had come through and blown it into the back of his girlfriend's car. Investigators are like, so that monsoon also cleaned the three shelves in the carport, abracadabra type of monsoon? That don't make no sense. Right. Steven, right? Okay. Lastly, there is the financial motivation, right? Not only is it clear in emails between Carol and Steve that he was overpaying, you know, her alimony, but he had two life insurance policies on her totaling $750,000 and he was paying the mortgage on her home. So with her gone, he would be free to sell the house. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, Steve says, blah, 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 things weren't that bad. My business was on the up and I wasn't desperate at all. He also says that he handed over the life insurance policy to his daughters, so there. Well, not really. The thing about the life insurance is that the company was not going to pay him because he was a suspect in the murder. So it was, you know, handed over to his daughters, or just go ahead and wait till you're acquitted. Then we'll give you the money, Steve. Right. And so what he did was manipulate his daughters into collecting the policy, transferring it over to Steve's parents so they could pay for Steve's lawyers. There is a recorded jail phone call that they use during the trial to show what a douchebag Steve is when his daughter informs him that she's collected the policy, but she's putting some of it aside to pay for her younger sister to go to college. And Steve says something like, uh, yeah, last priority, sweetie. <laughs> What's his first priority going to the, the golf club? Yeah. I mean, it's like, well, he wants to pay his lawyers, but it's like, you know, she's just thinking about their future. Like this isn't looking good, dad. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, his daughter sounds like a real smart girl based off this phone call, but under the pressure of Steve and the rest of his family, she did cave and transfer all the money over. No, she did not. Yeah, she did. So at the trial, Steve's defense was like no DNA, no proof. And they also said investigators had a case of tunnel vision and Steve like you, Tabby, he pointed the finger at Ed. Okay, Ed's DNA was found on Carol's doorknob. Okay, right? Well, and he's a snooper. Well, Ed comes over all the time. Yeah. They're friends, okay? And on some of Carol's papers that were on the counter. 
So Steve's lawyer's theory is that Ed Knapp was motivated to kill Carol because, you know, he was in love with her and she was not loving him back. And then because he saw that she did, in fact, have some money in an account. That was what was on these papers. And she could have used it to invest in his coffee shop. But she had told him, like, you know, she didn't have the money. And that's when he thought, that's when he lost it and killed her. But he was watching his son, right, over at his ex's house. Good alibi. Well, it turns out that's not, not as airtight as originally thought. His son says he was in his room for hours watching movies, and he can't be sure whether or not his dad was actually home. So, you know, it sounds like, you know, the price is right, Ed. Be Ed. Come on down. Take, take the stand and, you know, explain yourself. Well, unfortunately, that was not possible because before the trial started, Ed committed suicide. What? Yes. The circumstances surrounding his suicide are strange. First of all, he died from a single gunshot to the head, but there were multiple shots fired in the room. There was no note left, and there were drawers rifled through and opened, and things knocked over like it had been staged, similar to Carol's death. Dude. But it couldn't have been Steven because it, wait, oh, at, the time, been he Steven. Was, at the time, Steven was locked up awaiting trial. Oh, no way. So there's also this other issue with Ed. Did he or did he not really have cancer? His family is adamant that he did. He definitely had health issues. But Steve's defense team says there's no proof Ed had melanoma, and I didn't find anything concrete either that showed that he did. But, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. So Ed's family says, you know, it sucks. Ed was dragged into this whole thing, and they weren't s surprised, sadly, that he took his own life because he knew he was going to die. You know, and they say, so please just let him rest in peace. So I understand why they feel that way since he isn't around to defend himself. But also, you know, it's weird, right? Right. It would have been it would have been real nice if he had just left a note. OK, so Steve's trauma was drama filled for sure. First the judge had to step down because he found out he had a terminal brain tumor. And so there was a five week break while they appointed someone new. And then there was the business about these anonymous emails. So an email was sent to the state attorney's office and other offices involved in the case that said that Carol was killed because Ed was involved in a drug ring and it contained some specifics about Carol's house that weren't publicly known. Now, Steve also claimed he had heard this theory through a vent in the jail where he was being housed. So, you know, it was like fact. Um. Every inmate that could have possibly communicated with Steve was questioned, and they all denied it. They located the internet cafe where the email was sent from, but couldn't figure out who the sender was because they paid cash. The emails were huge for Steve's defense, but eventually the emails were traced back to Steve's youngest daughter, and she took the stand and said, her dad had held up a piece of paper with instructions for her to send the phony email during a visit. And so she did it. Steve's why lawyer. She, why would she do that? Well, because she's like a daddy's girl. Oh, man. So Steve's lawyer had presented the email. Steve's lawyer did not know that these were fake, mm -hmm. right? 
And he had presented them in court as they were legit. And so he was pissed and felt duped. Duped, and Yeah. Yeah, So he resigned from the case. He's like, what am I going to do with this? Now you're lying to me. You got to tell me the truth so I can figure out how to like, oh my God, this was such a mistake. By the way, at this point, the lawyers had eaten up all of that $750,000. Okay. There was no money left. And um, Steve's defense of his dishonest actions were that he really heard it through the vent and he is facing death. So he would do anything to get out of it. I mean, yeah, clearly he would do anything. He would ask his daughter, you know, yeah, to risk her freedom and do the unthinkable. And he doesn't give a shit about his college fund. So it was the trial was a mistrial after this. Well, after that debacle, it was a couple years before it went to trial again. And this time around, the prosecutors were determined to find out whose DNA was under Carol's fingernail, because that was the one really missing piece of the puzzle. You know, Steve could always say, look, there, there was somebody else's DNA there and none of mine is. Okay. So they cross-referenced the DNA to the last 12 men who had autopsies performed on them before Carol's. And you know what? They found a match. It was a case of contamination. It was impossible for this dead man to have been Carol's killer. Steve's girlfriend also testified that Steve had buried a getaway bag on the golf course a month after Carol died, and she was able to take detectives to the bag filled with cash, hair dye, a book about living as a fugitive. Also, more evidence was presented that Steve was planning on running. He had recently purchased an unregistered motorcycle and had, you know, like more incriminating getaway bags packed. Steve concedes, yeah, I was thinking about running, but hello, I didn't. And I was thinking about it because it's real scary being a murder suspect. He had a harder time explaining why he had so many internet searches for how to commit a murder, but make it look like an accident on his computer. (laughs) He doesn't take Gretchen's but, 101 course. No, he didn't. <laughs> but um, but he did have an explanation for this. He said that it was research for a book he was writing. Oh, I love that. Like the he, fire starter who wrote yeah. the book. Just like, like okay. Yeah. His daughter says, yeah, she had heard her dad talk about writing a book book. Mm. she doesn't really say that she's sure this book was like a murder mystery or what she thought it was about i mean you know so there's that so when the trial concluded the jury found stephen demacher guilty at the moment they pronounced him guilty stephen you know showed no real emotion which to me says he's guilty for sure that's how I could tell. Right. Mm -hmm. Guilty people show no emotion. When innocent people are found guilty, they like break down. Guilty people are not surprised. Okay. Well, his daughters and family don't seem to think that he is. And they asked the judge for leniency at the sentencing. Um, I can imagine it's a, it's a struggle for the girls. They've already lost their mother and coming to terms with that. Their father is the killer when they're, there is no DNA found in the house, which would make it like indisputable, you know? You wore gloves. Um, What can I say? I mean, he already looked at, he totally, he totally wore gloves. Yeah. And yeah, he probably wore a hairnet also. You know what I yeah. mean? Like he did, he did a little research. Yeah. 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 And these girls, they were daddy's girls. 
you know? Yeah. Um, before this, he had a close relationship with them. He kind of, you know, he kind of spoiled them, you know, bought them real nice cars and, you know, stuff like mm-hmm. that, you know? Mm-hmm. And I am I am curious to know, I know that they have both grown up and become successful, but I'm curious if they still, after all these years, they still kind of side with their dad. You know, maybe. time maybe gives you some perspective. I don't know. Carol's mother, Ruth, who was on the phone with her, believes it was Stephen. She thinks her last words were, oh no, like, oh no. Steven's Steven's back. What does he want? She says it wasn't, it wasn't like, oh no, like a a panic. Some mystery man is breaking in. Yeah. No, it's. Yeah. Oh God. There's Steven again. Oh no. What the heck does he want? Yeah. So his girlfriend that had gone to the police, you know, and showed them the getaway bag or whatever concedes. It took her a minute, but now, you know, she thinks he probably did it. Mm -hmm. So Stephen is serving his life sentence at Douglas prison facility in Arizona. It is a medium security prison. It doesn't seem like a terrible place to be. I've seen much worse prisons is what I'm saying. Not a terrible place to be locked up if that's your fate, but I'm sure it still sucks for Stephen without all those hormones and supplements that he was used to taking to stay all hyped up. Did he, did he gain some weight? No, asshole. No, it doesn't. (laughs) I checked and you can't bring in food except for on um, holidays. So I don't imagine he's getting a lot of veggie stir fries in there. Right. No. They have a couple of work programs for inmates and Steven works in the library as an aide at the moment. He looks about the same in his most recent muggy, uh, little like more gray hair and doesn't look like he has any more appeals on the horizon. He is 68 years old today. Today? Um, it's his birthday today? It's no, no, his birthday isn't today. I just mean like oh. at this moment. Oh, I was like, wow. 68. Yeah. Um, lastly, I wanted to say I read the book, Then No One Can Have Her by Caitlin Rother, which is where I got a lot of information for this case. I mean, to tell you the truth, the book was boring AF, so save yourself the time. <laughs> I did it for you. <laughs> Uh, that's a WAP. Thank you for reading all of that for us. I'm reading a book right yeah. now for the next case also. And it's, it's, it's more interesting than that, but yeah, I don't, sometimes I don't read books. The book was great. It gave me a good headspace to like understand like the dynamics of his relationship with like, you know, his daughters, stuff you don't get from just reading like, you know, the court papers and they skip all that part on like, right. you know, 48 hours and stuff, you know, like you don't get the backstory, but it's still, you know, I'm like a cut to the chase kind of girl. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why our episodes are like an hour per whole case instead of like, yeah, 20 next, next week on housewives, (laughs) we'll play a lot of extra music, take long pauses and play a lot of that music. Yeah. It gets you, you know, you're like, Oh, what's next? No, 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 no. I don't like a cliffhanger. Give it to me. You know, the book that I'm reading, the kids, Keepers of the Lost Cities, every chapter is like a cliffhanger. And so my, my son's always like, okay, one more chapter, mom, one more chapter. Oh, it's kind of fun. But then I'm like, "Uh, it's 9.05. We have to go to bed. I'm almost done with my fourth book, by the way. Oh, good for you. My fourth 700 page reading out loud. Oh my God. Wow. Snaps for tab, everyone. Listen, that's more 
than I have, I think, ever read in my whole entire life. Including college, <laughs> probably. <Yes. laughs> so I'm pretty proud of myself. Yeah. I, I love the cliff notes. You know, I used to always, I was like, oh, there was totally. a book with cliff notes. Now they have freaking cliff notes for everything. Plus, I mean, kids have it so easy these days. You could, you can look up anything on the internet and get all of the information. If yeah. Only. If only if we only. had that, I would have gotten straight A's for sure. Uh-huh. JK, you got any, we got any shout outs or any other piece of business? Um, Let me, let me see. I got to go outside and see if the trees cut down. It is. It's the okay. most exciting thing happen. It is cut down. I know it. Uh, thank you for your guys' reviews um, on Apple. If you listen there, Bree, Barbree, thank you so much. And Marisa May or Marissa, Marissa or Marisa. No, thank you to Rory's mom. Not thanking that lady. Although she said she loved us, but then she also hated us. So I don't know what that's about. I did. I'm get... okay with that. I love hate a lot of people. <laughs> if you love hate somebody, then you give them like a four star, not less than that. Oh, yeah, that's bullshit. Mm -hmm. So I guess she hated us more than loved us. I found something for you to get your husband at Home Goods. Oh, I'm sure that totally sounds like his jam. I took a what picture is it? of it for you. <laughs> it, sa it says, work like a captain, play like a pirate. Oh, yeah. Have you heard? Have you seen that saying before? I have no. not seen that saying, but, um, you know, our, uh, argument in circles is that, um, don't captain my ass. You're not the yes. captain of this house. <laughs> so I don't want to give him anything. He already has some koozies that say like captain or like some shit, you know, mm -hmm. I don't want to give him anything else that goes to his head. <laughs> that doesn't really go to his head though. I would say. Uh, no maybe uh, I think that's a wop okay so thank you guys for listening follow us on housewives of true crime group for some extra information and just to tell us what you think about crimes that we cover or crimes that we don't cover check um, us out on the youtube the youtube I is hwtc you look real cute today. There's an, we're like a couple behind, but we're going to catch up because our, our Damian was uh, on vacation in the Germany. He was mm -hmm. traveling. I tried to have a meet up with Cindy Sue, but he didn't make it to Berlin. Yes. I'm always trying to connect people, you know, Yeah. in different yeah. countries mm -hmm. and my own. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, YouTube HWTC, you know, Housewives True Crime. Yeah, that's what it means. If you didn't you know. can just Google Housewives of True Crime on YouTube and it'll come right up. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if you Google yeah. our names if it comes up on YouTube. If you like put Tab and Gretch or Tabitha and Gretchen. I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, um, have a wonderful week, you guys. It's a full week since last week was the Labor Day week. Feels real fast. Um, and I think that's it. So clink, clink. Okay, clink, clink.